Okay, we're going to do a second presentation or every other Shabbat I speak, every, we started uh, two Shabbats ago, uh, a series on what are known as the Beatitudes or the blessings uh, that Yeshua, our Messiah, taught as part of his, what's called the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, it was an introduction. And today we start with the first one and it's, it says, uh, we are blessed by being poor in spirit. And you might say, how can we be blessed by that? Well, let's ask the Lord to lead us in this presentation of his word. May he speak to us. Father, thank you again for this service. Thank you for those taking part uh, in many ways. And thank you for those that are here. Thank you for our children. Thank you for Suzanne, uh, who's helping with them. And thank you for each one that is here today. They are here with a purpose and for a reason. And those that are joining us via Zoom as well. So speak to our hearts, Lord, speak to our need, and may we respond according to your will. And we pray in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. So this, uh, this second uh, presentation of uh, our topic uh, is based on the first book in the Brit Hadashah, Matthew or Matityahu. And the, it covers three chapters, is a whole, what's called the whole Sermon on the Mount, and Yeshua's most famous sermon. Uh, it's a compilation of all his teachings, and uh, where he shows his heart, where he tells us how God wants us to live, how, where he interprets the Torah for us, and, and, and uh, gives a, a great, great teaching. And so what we're going to talk about is just the beginning of that. And uh, this this sermon, the Lord Yeshua um, addressed mostly his followers. You know, the people follow first a few, then more and more. Uh, some of you might have watched uh, different, you know, representations or interpretation of, of Messiah's life through the movies or through different uh, dramas or books or whatever. Now there's a series on TV that has its own interpretation of Yeshua's life, but whatever the case, uh, they tried to say how many people were following him and there are multitudes. The Bible says that, you know, sometimes he had crowds of 3,000 and 5,000 and even more. And now uh, some believe that's even double or triple that because sometimes they only counted uh, the men. So, um, you know, the, the, the great multitudes followed him. So he was mostly addressing the followers, but also addressing crowds in general. And that's why the Word of God is so applicable to us as well today, the teachings of Messiah. Uh, for some reason here, I cannot move forward. Let me see. Okay. Did I do something wrong? Am I, I'm, oh, there we go. Here, okay. Something was wrong. So uh, within such a diverse group of people, there were all kinds of people. There were, there were mostly Jews, but there were Samaritans. There were other non-Jewish people from other lands. And there must have been those uh, who understood uh, the religious practices of their forefathers. Um, sometimes they understood them just as rituals to be performed. And maybe some understood what the teaching of the, of, the, of the forefathers just as ceremonies to be kept or commandments to be obeyed. And yes, as Jewish people, we had to do that, but there is more to it than just doing it as a, as a repetitious act without any meaning or, or without the right attitude. So uh, there might have been something like some people like that. Others might have felt uh, the heavy burden of trying to fulfill all the regulations imposed and expect, expanded by the religious leaders. What do we mean by that? Well, you know, the, the Torah includes a to total of 613 commandments. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a heavy burden to try to fulfill. And I always ask people, you know, my Jewish brothers and sisters, and I say, uh, do you keep the 613 commandments? And most of them say, no. And I say, do you know a rabbi that keeps all the 613 commandments? And if we're honest, we have to say no. And then I say, do you know anybody that can keep the 613 commandments? And we have to be honest with ourselves and say, no, we can't. 
And so that that is a burden that we that we follow. It's it's a good. It's the law of God is good for us. Uh, but the Lord put it as a as a as a as something as a goal to be fulfilled. This is this is my standard, and this is what I expect. Now it's 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 impossible for us to fulfill it all. So some in the crowd might have felt like that. Some in the crowd might have seen uh, their religious obligations as totally separate from their everyday life. You know, uh, uh, the Jewish people, our, our life is is in intertwined with the word of God, with Torah, with, with our tradition, with our with our practices. And so uh, it, it's, it's, we're part with who we are. But for some people, and we have these kinds of people today as well, some people separate, you know, the religious life with my everyday life outside of my faith. Huh? And some people, you know, in, the, in Yeshua's time and in, even today, we have to be honest. Some people say, okay, I do this for, for the Lord and I do that, but then on my private life is my life. Okay? And so all kinds of people, and I'm sure that within the crowd that was following Yeshua, there were undoubtedly some that uh, were sincere and devout, like we have people here and, and in other places that are sincere and devout in their practices of Torah uh, and following the Lord as, as best as we can. Uh, maybe they were curious to hear about what this new rabbi that showed up in Galilee and in Israel was going to teach. So there were all kinds of people, just like we have all kinds of people today. Uh, maybe among us in our around us in society, maybe watching us uh, through Zoom or here and following us through Zoom. So this was a teaching. But so then in the midst of it all, Yeshua starts teaching and he inserts or reinserts a word that we're not so used to hearing. And he says, happy. Some translation says fortunate. Some translation said prosperous or blessed are you when you do this, that, or the other. Blessed are. And so this is something that he brings new to our life. And, and, and yes, our faith uh, has requirements and our faith has uh, things that are not so easy, but we have to be reminded that that's part of the service and the sermon and the message of, of the Lord, that as we serve the Lord, that as we follow the Lord, we shouldn't be a burden, but we should enjoy it. We should be happy and fortunate as we do. Now, uh, that's what we said, uh, the blessings of the Lord. And, and if we look at the, our, our passage in Matthew, Yahu, or Matthew chapter 5, uh, uh, in, in, most, in most versions and the complete Jewish ver uh, Bible that we use in our congregation, it is like that. It has an exclamation point at the end because it's not just a declaration, but our exclamations. Huh? It wasn't a, a, a soft thing. He was saying, happy are those who do this. No, he says, happy, blessed are you. Huh? Exclaim it, shout it out. Huh? Happy, blessed are the poor in spirit. And I have the word are in, uh, in brackets because uh, neither in the Hebrew nor in the Greek original translations, the verb are is there, to be is there. So it just... It should just be blessed, the poor in spirit. How blessed, how happy, how joyful you should be if you're, a, if you're poor in spirit. Now, blessings, beatitudes, another, another interesting thing is that they're not things that uh, are, are we wish to happen, but they're sort of congratulations. Our saying is congratulations, because this already, you already have, this already exists. Huh? Not something that might happen in the future or a wish that a thing that will happen. But he's saying, you know, blessed, the poor in spirit. You already are. If you are, you're blessed already. It's not something that you wish to happen. It's more of a congratulations if you are uh, uh, poor in spirit. Now, the, the joy and happiness that the believer in Yeshua has is to be lived and enjoyed here and now, something that, as we said, already began to enjoy. He or she already begins to enjoy. It's not something one day I should be blessed and happy. No, it's for here and now. And you say, but Brother Jorge, we live in a situation that is tough. My job is, and I don't have a good job. My family, my, my finances, my neighbors, 
my family, my friends, all this, that, uh, the government is after me for this, whatever it is. It's not so easy. How can I be happy? Well, the Lord has something for us today, and I hope that you get this message because it's speaking to me as it speaks to you. The joy and happiness that a believer in Yeshua has is to be lived and enjoyed here and now. Not something, it's something that you should already have. Now, the, the joy and happiness will also be completely fulfilled when we are in God's presence for eternity, but we already experience it, this in our lives. That's why the verse in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, says, How blessed are the poor in spirit, or how blessed are the poor in spirit. And then it says, For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. So that's why he finished the exclamation stating, The kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed if you are poor in spirit. You can start enjoying that now. You, your happiness, your blessed, your blessing, you enjoy now. But you also have a reward. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. So there's a here and now, there is a future thing. Matthew Henry, who is a one of the classic biblical scholars, I don't agree with him in everything. Like, you know, we don't agree with everybody with everything. The only one I agree with everything is with the Lord. Sometimes with my wife, we have our differences, right? Everybody does. But he has some good things. And, and this classic uh, interpreter of scripture says the following regarding what is the purpose of these blessings? Or the other is the one purpose, he says, they're destined, these blessings are to rectify the ruining errors of a blind and carnal world. Now, is he talking about a, a, another, another world in space? No, he's talking about our world. Our world is like that, just as it was at the beginning, just as it was in, in Yeshua's time. Uh, these are to rectify the errors in the, the, in the world we live. They are also destined to eradicate the discouragement of, a, of the weak and poor who receive the gospel. What does it mean by that? Well, the gospel, the good news of Messiah, Yeshua, that's what the word gospel means, good news. Huh? Good news. Uh, the good news of Messiah. Well, we have them. It says, it's, it's to eradicate the discouragement of the weak and poor. We are blessed. Sometimes we feel that we're down. Sometimes we feel that we're only ones that follow Yeshua. Sometimes we feel we're only believers and everybody's against us. No, don't be discouraged. That's, that's the purpose of these blessings, to eradicate discouragement in your life. They're, they're also destined to invite souls to Messiah, people to Messiah, and to open the way for his law to enter the hearts. Hmm? The law, remember in, the, in one of the prophets uh, in Jeremiah, uh, the Lord had promised that there would be one day where we would make, you know, it was written before the Messiah Yeshua came many, many centuries before. And Jeremiah says, the Lord says, I will put my Torah, my law in your hearts huh? and, 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 uh, and you will have it in you and there will be no need for others to teach you, but you will have it in your hearts. That's a new covenant. That's what Yeshua brings to our life. It's inviting us to Messiah so that his Torah will make its way to its heart and then to our hearts. And then these Beatitudes, these blessings are also destined to clarify and summarize the articles of the agreement between God and man. Huh? Agreement or covenant, the covenant that God made with us, these blessings, these uh, Beatitudes, the purpose is so that they would clarify. So what does it mean? And we're going to look at four things very quickly. What does it mean to be poor in, sp in spirit? To be poor in spirit, first of all, we need to acknowledge our spiritual poverty. Blessed the poor in spirit. Happy the poor in spirit. How do you know? Well, we have to acknowledge that we're uh, spiritually poor. The word in Greek that is used there is betokos, and it means absolute poverty, lowest state, one that has nothing, a destitute. That's a poor person. There is nothing, however, as sad as seeing not just a poor person in general, but it's sad to see a person who has a need who doesn't realize he has a need. You know, one of the rules of, of trying to help people in their in their struggles and as a leader of a congregation, as a minister, as a rabbi, I get calls, I get I get people to come and see me and so forth, ask counsel. But sometimes 
you cannot help somebody that doesn't want to understand that they need something. And there's nothing worse than having a person has a need and they don't see the need. They can't be helped. Not even God can help you if you don't see your need. And in Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21, Yeshua told the story of a man who had a distorted concept of how to manage his possessions. You know, we're talking about being poor spiritually. Uh, you might be rich uh, materially, but you might be spiritually poor. And this is one of those cases. And Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21 tells a story. Then he told him a parable. Yeshua told him a parable. A rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I will do this, he said. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I shall, I say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. If you other word, eat, drink, and be merry. Huh? Enjoy yourself. You have everything you need. But God said to him, you fool. Wow. Strong words. You fool, this very night, your life is demanded of you. Other versions say, uh, you're going to, your life is ending this night. This very night, the life is demanded of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose should they be? In other words, who will enjoy all the things that you have? What good is it for? That's how it is when to the one who stores up treasure for himself, and it is not rich towards God. It is telling us the importance of being rich towards God, to have God in our lives and to give him a place. It's interesting, this man never realized that the heart and the soul cannot survive with food and drink. Food and drink are for the body, for the physical body, but the heart and the soul need spiritual food. Huh? There's nothing wrong with, with material things. There's nothing wrong with them. There's nothing wrong with having a nice place uh, to live and in a car to drive around and, and clothes. To, it's nothing wrong as long as they don't become our God and the object of our worship. And all our life is around the things that we have and we own. Mm -hmm. Due to his stupidity, this man in the scripture, in the parable, his attachment to material things, God called him a fool. Again, there's nothing wrong with good things. The question is, do our, are we controlled by them? Do we just live for them? Or do we have a good priority of the values in our life? Hmm? So God compares, unfortunately it says in that passage, God compares men and women of all times with this man. Hmm? Because the Lord said, the same is with anyone who is rich towards himself and not, or things and not towards God. So be careful. I don't want to be called a fool by anybody, especially by God. I don't know there's nobody here like that, but just be warning. God gave us a physical body with senses and members, and we all have certain desires and appetites that are legitimate, legitimate when used within parameters. Huh? God created us with these needs, physical needs for our body. And as long as we use him according to his ways, everything's fine. We all get hungry. We all get thirsty. We all need companionship. We sexual needs are, are part of who we are as a, as, a, as a human being and other needs. But as long as they're used how God wants us to use them, according to his law, according to his parameters, everything's okay. When any of his legitimate needs are not under God's control, they can become harmful to our bodies, to our emotions, to our spiritual health. And sometimes they cause pain and ruin to our own lives and to our loved ones. We know this. We know this very closely. Some of you experience these things. Our families experience these things. When any of the physical needs are not under God's control, we're in trouble. So, we're not just a physical being, we're also a soul created on the image, in the image of God. That's what the Bible teaches. 
in Genesis, huh? from the beginning. A soul is our personality, our intelligence, our conscience, our memory, who we are as a person, who defines us as a person, our soul that makes us different from others. And our soul needs peace, and our soul needs contentment, and our soul needs significance. One of the things that, especially young people, but everybody, but especially young people, sometimes nowadays they say, I don't have any, what am I here for? What, I'm not good for nothing. I don't know, nobody. Else. And so there's a need for significance, for purpose in life, for satisfaction and happiness. Remember two weeks ago, I tried to play that old song, Satisfaction, huh? I can't get no satisfaction. That seems to be the word of the day. People try to, we have everything and most, all the gadgets that you can imagine that nobody else before us had, and yet there is no satisfaction, there is no happiness, there is no fulfillment in our souls. But why? It's because more than anything, we need have a need for God, our Creator. We need fellowship with Him. We were created like that. Whether we know it or not, we need fellowship with Him. We don't have that fellowship, nothing else will satisfy. Nothing. We can try, we can try to fill our need for anything, but only God can satisfy us fully. And it's not only okay, but necessary to dedicate time to our body's health, especially as we grow older, trust me. But there's nothing wrong, it's necessary, but through proper eating, drinking, resting, and exercising. There's nothing wrong with that. We need that. God wants us to be good stewards of our bodies. But we also need to feed our spirit with the spirit of God. Physical, spiritual. First Timothy, in the, in the Brick of the the New Covenant, it says in First Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, the Rabbi Shaul is talking and writing. He, he says, although physical exercise does have value, huh? he says, does have value. And remember, he was living in the first century with the Greeks, and the Greek culture was prominent, and the Greeks invented all the, you know, the sports and the competitions and all the things. Godliness is valuable for everything since it holds promise both for the present life and for the life to come. Again, let me repeat, there's nothing wrong with exercising. Taking care of our bodies is good. Just don't make that your God. Just don't make that the number one thing in your life. God is first. Spiritual living is ultra necessary, more than just physical. We need to worship God, spending time alone with Him, meditating on His Word, on the Word of God, on the Bible. I hope you do this. I hope you do spend with Him. Without God in our lives, we will never have shalom, peace. And you know, shalom means more than just peace, but completeness, fullness, being all that God wants us to be. And spiritual satisfaction. Now, for God to be first in our life, there are some few things that we have to we have to empty ourselves because before He can fill us. Uh, if your life is full of stuff inside, and your mind and your heart are full of things, and Lord, I don't have time. I have the family, the job, the this and the activity, this other activity. Now we have to empty something, get rid of stuff that is no good for you, and let the Lord fill you. We have to confess sins before he can forgive us huh? and, and and i would say confessing is more just saying lord forgive me we'll talk a little more about that we have to empty we have to confess before he can forgive us we have to become spiritually poor before he can make us spiritually rich not rich just rich oh brother jorge said if uh, god will make me rich no spiritually rich he might bless you in other ways. Sometimes he does. But we're not talking about that. Okay? The disease that separates us from God and that we have to eliminate, the Bible calls it SIN. Not the SIN card that Canadians have. We used to have a SIN number, now we have a card. But sin. It says in Romans 3, 22, 23, for it makes no difference whether one is a Jew or a Gentile, non-Jew, since all have sinned and come short of the glory of God or earning God's praise, as this version says. No, we're all. 
And because of our forefathers that fell in the Garden of Eden, we all have this tendency towards wrong, towards evil. And God calls that sin. So we have to acknowledge it. We have to confess it. We have to repent of it. And we have to ask God for forgiveness through Messiah's atoning sacrifice. So first of all, we have to acknowledge that we have a need, that we are poor spiritually. The second thing is, to be poor in spirit, we need to receive Messiah's riches provided through his death and resurrection. Acknowledge, receive his riches. Sin, confusion, disappointment in life can be replaced by righteousness, joy, satisfaction, and happiness. Can't do it ourselves, can't do it alone, but we can get rid of it with God's help. God's peace and happiness do not depend on external circumstances. Let me repeat that. It doesn't depend on external circumstances where you have the joy of the Lord, where you have the happiness of God, where you have the peace and shalom of God. It's not dependent on other circumstances. It depends on what Messiah did 2,000 years ago when he died on Golgotha or Mount Calvary to give us abundant life, joy, and peace. That's what he died for, for you and for me. So this was greatest, God's greatest act of love to reconcile us with him. He did it all. He did it for you. He did it for me. That's how he showed his love for us by giving of his son to take our place. Now, as we said, sin separates us from God, brings sadness, bitterness, dissatisfaction, and misery. Why do I say that? Because sometimes when, when you're tempted and, you, and, and you're tempted by something, you know, temptation looks nice. You'll never see a temptation that doesn't look nice. Otherwise, it wouldn't be temptation is not attractive, but temptation usually looks nice. Huh? That, uh, you know, that million dollar house or that, you know, the, or somebody else has and I want. Or that, uh, you know, half a million dollar car that somebody has and I don't have and I want. Or somebody else's wife or husband. Sometimes we're attracted. Most things, temptation looks nice. It's attractive. But in the end, it brings sadness and bitterness and dissatisfaction and misery. I would even dare to say, you know, you never will hear a commercial on the radio or TV about the casino or, 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 the, or the lottery saying, oh, no, it's terrible. Don't, don't, don't go to the casino or don't spend your money in the lottery. No, they just show you the good side. They never show you the bad side. But in the end, it brings sadness, bitterness, dissatisfaction, and misery. On the other hand, God's righteousness requires that someone pay for the death sentence that sin brings to us all. You know, the verse we read said, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But then it says that because of that, the penalty of our sin is separation from God. And there is there has to be somebody. God demands a sacrifice so that the sentence uh, is paid for. And so that's where Messiah came in. Hmm? Messiah he died so that he carried our sentence, my sentence, my guilt upon himself, paying for our sin debt, what the Bible calls substitutionary death. Isaiah 53, 6 says, huh? All we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone took his own way, but the Lord put upon him, laid upon him, upon who? Upon Messiah, the sacrifice the sin of us all, the guilt of us all, the iniquity of us all. He's, he's our substitute, my substitute and yours. So what God requires, again, confession, which is more than just saying, forgive me, is declaring our sin. You know, one thing is to say, Lord, forgive me my sins. Another thing is to say, Lord, forgive me when I lie, when I treat my wife wrongly, when I cross somebody in front and I shouldn't have. When I had bad thoughts about this, bad thoughts, and you start to enumerate and say, wow, that's a lot. It's easy to say, forgive me my sin. It's more difficult to enumerate. That's confession. Repentance means not just saying, I'm sorry. Repentance means turning 180 degrees. 180 degrees. I was going this way 
towards sin. Now I go the other way towards God. That's repenting, not just feeling bad. And then we have to receive, asking Yeshua, Messiah Yeshua, to come to our lives, to abide in our lives through faith or trust. Huh? Confessing, repenting, asking him to come into our lives. It says in Romans 10, 9, that if you acknowledge publicly with your mouth that Yeshua is Lord and trust in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved or you will be delivered. It's a promise. Confess him. Ask him to come into your life and he will come by faith. So uh, when you do this, what's, that's what the Bible calls being born again spiritually. That means that God gives us a new nature a new life, a new, it makes us a new person inside out. And true peace comes and satisfaction comes and joy fills our heart. Will everything be without problems? No. Will we have trouble and difficulties? Yes. But God's peace and satisfaction and joy will never leave us. His presence will never leave us. He gave, makes us a new question. Ask yourself a question. You don't have to answer it out loud, but ask yourself the question. Have I taken these steps of confessing, repenting, and receiving Yeshua in my own life before God? I hope you have. Not just heard about him, not just know about him. Do I know him? Have I invited him? Is he living in me? I pray that you ask yourself a question that you can answer it appropriately. This is the way God requires for us to relate to him. See, God doesn't just want us to follow rules and things, obey his word is good. It's God's word. He wants us to have a relationship with him, personal relationship. He wants us to know him, him to know us. There's no way, other way to true happiness than that. The third thing, and we'll move along there, to be poor in spirit, we need to be aware of our dependence upon God. First, we say we need to acknowledge that we're poor. Second thing is we have to receive the riches that the Lord Yeshua gives us through his sacrifice. And third, we have to be aware of our dependence upon God. This is one of the toughest things in our lives. If you heard the prayer that Ruth mentioned a, a few minutes ago, she said, forgive us for our pride. Hmm? This is what it's talking about. The word for poor in Hebrew, ani, in Greek, ebion. And the meaning is, according to another author, Barclay, who is very well known, although I don't agree with him on everything, just to let you know, somebody was coming, you, you agree with Barclay? Not in everything, but in some things I do. According to Barclay, meaning of the word changes through time. First, it's poor. That means having less than what's needed to survive. But as a consequence of that, I would agree that's a poor person having the less than what's needed to survive. But a consequence of that, a person is poor without influence or power, it's helpless, and it lacks prestige, Barclay says. And then when we lose everything, we have less than what we need to survive. We lose all these things. And then because of this, this person is, is a destitute, is despised and oppressed. Ah, has nothing, is down to nothing. Lost everything, lost life, lost family, lost job, lost dignity, lose everything. That's a poor spiritual person. And so when we run out of everything, all, all our human resource, then the person starts to seek for God and put his trust in God. And sometimes, and I hope it's not your case, but sometimes we have to get to that point. God has to call our attention, say, I'm going to, like Job, remember Job, huh? He was a rich man. God allowed the, the, the enemy, Satan, to take everything away. And he had nothing. Lost family, lost riches, got sick. And, and the friends say, oh, just forget about God. His wife even said, forget about God. Curse God and die. But he kept his faith in this. The worst of his life kept his faith, and God restored him to a life that was even better than before. So we need to be dependent upon God. Yeshua referred to this condition of depending upon God is, and being poor spiritual like little children, being like children. He said there in Matthew 18, three, I tell you 
that unless you change, change and become like little children, you won't even enter the kingdom of heaven. And it doesn't mean that we have to crawl on the, on the floor and, uh, and uh, no, no, it doesn't mean that. What he's talking about, what is a child? A child is dependent on the parents, on the family, on everybody to feed them, to clothe them, to bring them their needs. That's, that's what God is talking about. Be dependent like children are dependent. That's how he wants us to be, on him, not on ourselves. When we trust in Yeshua, we become children of God. He says in John chapter 1. But oh, how do you become a, a child of God? Remember, I always say, difference between a creature we're all God's creatures. We're not all God's children. According to the Bible, don't trust me, trust the Bible. The Bible says, all who received him, Yeshua, the Messiah, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, trust in his name. And so we become like children who we trust him. And God adopts us as his own children. He says, in Ephesians 1 5, he predestined us to be adopted through Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Messiah, for himself according to his favor and will. So, wherever you are, whoever you are, Jew, Gentile, wherever, remember this God wants you to be his child. And for to, to do that, you need to have trust and faith in Yeshua as the Messiah. And as dependent children, we shouldn't worry so much about our physical and material needs. God already provides for them. Huh? God already provides for them. As children uh, trust their parents or whoever is taking care of them. Matthew 6.31, part of this sermon. Remember the Sermon on the Mount was Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. In chapter 6, Yeshua said, so don't worry saying, what will we eat or what will we drink? I know sometimes we ask ourselves, how do I make it to the end of the month? I remember when my wife and I were students in seminary. We lived day by day. And sometimes she would say, hey, we don't have anything to buy food for. Well, we got to trust the Lord. And then we will receive a coupon on the mail saying a free burger over there. We'll go and what do you want a free burger? Anything else? No, that's it. Just a coupon. We were there. It's not easy. So we all ask ourselves, but the Lord says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be provided for you. Trust the Lord, no matter where you are, what situation you're in. God wants us to ask him for our needs. Without fear, unashamedly, boldly, we have that right to ask him for our needs, not for our wants, but for our needs. He wants us to ask. He says, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. He wants us to ask. We have that right. Don't be ashamed. Be, you know, that's another sermon. I won't preach it, but be specific. If there's something you really need, Ask the Lord specific. He answers specific questions. Ask his specific prayers. He has a right to give you or not, but you have the right to ask according to his will. Go to God daily in prayer and seeking his will in his word, the Bible. Huh? Lord, I want a red Mercedes convertible. Well, you know, maybe God says, you don't need that. So that's why I don't have it. Because I don't need it, God says so. Like a good father, he will then give us out of his abundant riches. He wants to bless us. He wants to, well, finally, the fourth point. How to be poor. To be poor in spirit, we need to deny ourselves willingly to serve God better. Deny ourselves willingly, not mandatory, not forced by anybody else. Yeshua told his Talmudim, his disciples, if anyone wants to come after me, follow me. He says, let him know, say no to himself. Take up his execution stake or cross and keep following me. What does that mean? Huh? Deny yourself. You want to serve the Lord. Not think just of yourself. Think of others. Take up your, your calling, what God has for you, for the, for the Lord. He had the execution stake. For you, it might be something else. Whatever God is calling you to do, take the challenge that God has for you and keep following him. Not just one day, he's keep following me and you can serve him. 
Now, this goes against society, all right? We're going against the flow in case you didn't know it. If you're a follower of Yeshua, you follow, try to follow God's word. We're going against the stream, the current. Why? Because our self-sufficient, self-relying, self-dependent society has produced more alcoholics, drug addicts, substance abusers, criminals, wars, broken homes, death, suicides, and the law, the list goes on and on. Because of why? Because we think that me, myself, and I can do it all. And it's all about me. No, it's not. It's all about God. It's time to put less trust and confidence in ourselves and more trust and confidence in God. Now, let me clarify, you know, because some people are so down in themselves, you know, that, oh, I'm good for nothing. Oh, nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. The world is against me. Oh, me, poor me. You know? So people have to say, oh, trust in yourself, believe in yourself. That's good. But the world now is going the other way. We're going so much and trusting you, believing you, is you, you, you. Don't worry about anybody else or anything else. It's just you. You're number one. You take care of yourself. Nobody will do it for you. Fight your fight. Well, that's not what the God says. It's, it's more about putting trust in him and less in ourselves. And the, and the God's, God's illogic is that the more we trust him and depend on him, the more blessed we are. The more uh, productive, the more successful we are, the more we trust him. When we trust ourselves, we go down the wrong path. We all need to put our arrogance, pride, and selfishness aside. Ooh, you have to say that. Yes, I have to say that. I'm talking to myself too, okay? We have to put our arrogance, pride, and selfishness aside and come to Adonai so he can give us true life, take away the sin that burdens us. Another, uh, I can't think of the English word, but the, the incongruence is not the word. But I'm thinking, the logic maybe, the different logic that God has is that when we fall on our knees and bow down before him, humble ourselves before him, he lifts us up. He makes us great in his sight. That's, that's a logic. That's the way God works. We have to forgive, repent, humble ourselves and when we humble ourselves he will lift us up to who he wants us to be we must discover the secret and joy of serving god and others to really be rich spiritually we must oh that went again someone said man's riches do not depend on the abundance of his possessions but on the lack of his necessities hmm. Man's riches does not depend on the abundance of possessions, but the lack of necessities, the less needs I have, that God has filled them, the less, the, the richer I am. I had a, a friend of mine, Marta will remember him in Argentina. His phrase was, uh, the, to be rich is not what you have, by what you do with what you have. That's what to be rich is. You want to be rich for the Lord? Use the things that he's blessed you with, whatever they are, to serve others, to share with others. Don't keep it to yourself. C.H. Spurgeon, who is a great preacher of the 19th century, he used to say, the first link between my soul and Messiah Christ is not my goodness, but my wickedness. It's not my merit, but my misery. And it's not my riches, but my needs. When we come to God, we don't come to him to say, hey God, I mean, this is or he said that, look how good I am. Look at all the good I do. I do this, that, look at that, learn, blah, blah. No, no, no. We want to come to God, first of all, confess, acknowledge that we are poor spiritually. And then he can start working in our lives. Well, Concluding, if you want to live and be part of God's kingdom, as it said, blessed the poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. 
lead to us, we recapitulate, we be poor in spirit according to what it means in the word of God. It doesn't mean to be throwing stuff on yourself and show how poor you are, but it's acknowledge our spiritual need is to come to Yeshua the Messiah, know, knowing that he is the one that has the answers and experience the joy and a new and abundant life. I hope you've come to that place in your life. I hope you've made that decision. And if not, there's always time. While we're here, there's always time. Don't be called by God what he called that man. I won't say the word. Only then will we be truly happy and blessed here in this life and enjoy the kingdom of heaven after this life. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Avinu Malkeinu, our Father, our King, thank you for the words of Messiah Yeshua. Thank you for having them available to us through your word, the Bible. Thank you for this tremendous sermon on the mount. And for the beginning of it with these blessings, these beatitudes, these, these words to make us happy and joyful according to your will. Father, forgive us, but we're not who, we, who you want us to be. Help us to know the meaning of being poor in spirit. The true meaning. Help us to be rich in you, in your word. Help us to be rich by serving others, helping others, sharing all the good things you give us with others. And mostly, Lord, help us to humble before you. Help us to acknowledge our mistakes, our sins. Help us to ask you for forgiveness. Help us to reconcile ourselves with you and with others around us that we hurt all the time. And Lord, help us to live a life that others would love to have because you are in us and it shows and it shows in our in our words in our language in our attitude help us to be the people you want us to be reflecting yeshua's light in his name we pray and we give you thanks amen, amen. and amen